Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Debbie, Debbie Solaris, you've said that humans are supposed to have 12 strand DNA, but do not. And that many people are struggling right now with their physicality and their spiritual growth, possibly because of the limitations of their own genetics. Did the galactic Akashic records show you that womankind and mankind was always meant to have a 12 strand DNA? First question and follow up is, and if so what were we supposed to be doing with it? How would it have changed us had we been intact? Um, that's an excellent question. It's actually a topic that I personally am uh, personally very interested in because I also went through my own personal health health struggles and health journey to get back to health um, after I started understanding the reasons why I was having so many health issues. Uh, what I found it with my extensive work with the galactic Akashic records is that there are certain star lineages that are currently um, actually part of our DNA here on earth. Uh, as, as I don't know if a lot of people know this, but earth humans, um, our genetics didn't originate from earth. Uh, we were a composite of at least 22 different star races from across the galaxy. So uh, we're kind of a Heinz 57 <laughs> of many different star people, but a lot of us currently that are born during this timeline are carrying genetics from our soul DNA that are, because a lot of us are star seeds, you know, we are, we, our souls didn't originate from earth. Uh, but getting back to the question about the 12 strand DNA, um, my understanding from what I saw in the Akashic records, and I've, like I've said, I've done thousands of these readings within the last decade, uh, is that earth humans um, genetically were always supposed to have 12 strand DNA here on this planet. This planet was supposed to be a fifth dimensional reality. And uh, during the Lemurian times, it was a fifth dimensional reality. So that's why Lemuria kind of stands out as this higher vibrational civilization from ancient, ancient times. But, um, um, and then we'll get into why that is no longer the case in a little bit. But, uh, but humans were supposed to um, experience or have a, a, an experience in a living library of, mo of a multitude of different DNA from different star systems and evolve spiritually with this, uh, I guess this melting pot of DNA from all these different systems. And, and we were supposed to thrive and evolve spiritually through this physical experience here on earth. Um, However, uh, my understanding is that uh, back in, I would say 70,000 BC, I'm just using that as a, an estimate of the time when Lemuria became destroyed. You know, so Lemuria um, uh, became destroyed during um, a, an attack from Atlantis. They went into this war. Um, and um, after that, uh, the genetics of, uh, or actually the dimension or the, uh, I should say the vibration of the planet plunged. Um, so after Lemuria, which was kind of the whole, the holding place of this higher dimensional frequency, after that civilization got destroyed, um, the dimensions plummeted from the fifth dimension to the third dimension. And then uh, Atlantis also fell, you know, uh, ultimately after that, which you know further cemented our plunge into the third dimension. Uh, a little bit after that, um, there were beings from the Sirius C, C, uh, Sirius C uh, star system. So Sirius is that you actually used to be a trinary star system. So the story continues. Uh, so there was these 
um, beings that resided in Sirius C that were um, hybrid beings, hybridized human reptilian genetics that we now know as the Anunnaki. Okay, they they mostly had human appearance. You know, so if you were to see an Anunnaki, you would say, yeah, they look a little little different, but they look pretty human. But uh, but they were. Um, they they had two factions. You know, I think a lot of people know that there was the the team um, Enlil and the team Enki. You know, Enki was kind of more the positive uh, uh, group of um, of Anunnaki, and then we had the the Enlil that was more the negative. Um, so the Anunnaki went through a catastrophe in their star system, which uh, plummeted their. Um, you know, their chances for survival in that star system. Um, as a matter of fact, their planet, which was Nibiru or planet X, as some people call it, got uh, thrown off its normal trajectory or its normal orbit through a trajectory towards Earth. Uh, so they decided to use Earth as their new home. And they took the genetics of the, uh, so they just decided, you know, hey, you know, we got these indigenous humans that live on planet Earth let's use them for slave purposes. Uh, so they downgraded the DNA um, through genetic manipulation from the 12 strand to the two strand that we currently have. Uh, from here, uh, earth humans were having a lot of physical issues uh, because earth humans were always supposed to have 12 strand DNA with this um, turning off of the 10 of the 12 strands, uh, they were finding that humans were no longer living hundreds of years. They were going, you know, they could barely make it to 40, 50 years. Uh, the other issue they were seeing is that women were dying in childbirth, you know, that they, they just weren't able to, if they did carry a baby to term, you know, they weren't able to survive. Uh, from there, there uh, the Anunnaki realized, I think the mistakes that they made, um, some of them did reach out to the other Syrians from Sirius A and B, mostly Sirius A, to ask for assistance from the very intelligent Syrian genetic uh, specialists that were resided in Sirius A. Uh, so these Syrians uh, decided, okay, we need to help the, the earth, uh, indigenous earth race, because they're not going to survive. Uh, so my understanding from, you know, the work that I've done with the records, you know, and I've, I've done a multitude of these, these types of readings. And uh, some of my clients were actually probably in a previous life involved with these projects. And pretty much what happened was the Syrian people decided, uh, hey, you know, let's use our own DNA to boost the human genome. Um, so there was um, an influence of, of uh, actually most of us here on earth actually carry Sirius A DNA. I would say that was probably the prominent genetics or the prominent star system that we received genetics from. There's also influences from Pleiadian genetics and other star systems, but I would say prevalently it's the Syrian genetics that a lot of us carry, but uh, even today. But um, what, what the problem was, was that they couldn't turn on, they had trouble turning back on the 10 of the strands that got turned off. So they were able to insert enough of their own genetics where at least earth humans can ascend, you know, so at least we're able to evolve spiritually. And at least our genetics were uh, somewhat strengthened. Uh, um, to go into the second part of your question, okay, so you were asking how does this influence us today and how does this impact our health? Uh, a lot of us carry kind of a comp compilation, like I mentioned before, of genetics from many, many different star systems. Uh, um, and uh, a lot of us choose to incarnate, um, that a lot of us have chosen to incarnate uh, into this reality uh, at this current timeline, um, are carrying soul DNA uh, from the star systems that we originated from or had incarnations in. Uh, however, because um, those star systems were so much higher vibrational, than the one that we're currently residing in right now, Earth is pretty dense, you know, it's only third dimension. 
compared to say the fifth dimension or the sixth dimension or the seventh dimensional realities that we came from in these other star systems. It's like our, our soul um, is anchored to our bodies, but there's not a really good genetic match. So a lot of us, when we undergo a lot of stress, um, we'll start developing health issues. To get, just to give you an example of the, a genetic line that you're very connected with personally, um, and uh, I think Lissa Royale Holt also talks about this star system quite a bit, is the Lyra star system. Um, that's where the human genetics actually originated from in this galaxy, was from the Lyra system. It's considered to be the home of human consciousness. And a lot of us do carry Lyran genetics. Uh, so what happens to a lot of us that maybe have had past lives in Lyra, or we might have had uh, maybe genetics from Lyra, is that um, when we're undergoing a lot of stress in this very low vibrational reality, our, genet our genetics start to, to degrade a little bit, and we start developing autoimmune conditions. Uh, a lot of us will develop fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or um, uh, or Hashimoto's thy thyroidosis or I mean there's a multitude of genetic of issues that we might develop especially in this timeline uh, because of this degradation of genetics and uh, this is something I'm personally doing a study on with a couple of epidemiologists. Um, um, there's going to be a book that's going to come out of this, but um, uh, but me personally, I also went I, because I also had lifetimes in Lyra. Um, I've I've struggled. I had my own personal health struggles that once I started understanding, like, hey, I really need to work on. Uh, changing my lifestyle or changing my habits and uh, learning to adapt within this limited reality that I'm in, um, I was able to, um, to transcend, you know, quite a few of my health issues, but it's an ongoing struggle for a lot of us because we're, we're having this mismatch of our soul DNA with the physical DNA. Um, and it's going to be, uh, my understanding, I think, is that I think as we start doing more frequency medicine here on this planet, uh, so we're going to be working more with frequency as, as opposed to pharmaceuticals that are usually synthetic. They're not a really great um, match for our physicality. Um, when we start working more with frequency, with sound, with color, with light, uh, uh, we're going to see a transcendence of health throughout, I'll say, this entire planet. And uh, my understanding is that there's currently alien DNA that's available on this planet that it, what they call med beds or, you know, high frequency devices that are going to help us transcend our health um, and help us to upgrade our DNA. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Very, very much so. Amazing. Thank you. And I took notes. Phenomenal, Deb. And um, I'm going to ask you the next question. And something I failed to mention is after I asked the question, if you could repeat the question into the answer, that would be beautiful. You actually ended up doing it anyway. But um, <clears throat> you have blogged, <clears throat> excuse me, you've blogged in the past about a Lakota story Mm -hmm. called We Live to Survive One Week with the Lakota. Mm -hmm. And there, the Lakota's connection to one's true ancestral potential. So I'm seeking right now for ancestral connection based on shamanism, specifically the indigenous shamans who are located all over this world. I've come to find out through my research the many, many, many countries began in Siberia and Eurasia, but then spread out in the world, China, all the Latin American countries, Africa, and way more than that. It's phenomenal. So the shamans do really incredible work in their practice, in their lineage, in their ancestral, what's been passed down. 
what connections are you aware of, Debbie, that is between shamanism and the indigenous and the galactic, between shamanism and the indigenous and the extraterrestrials? Do they have a connection? Are there shared practices? And are they connected? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, even the Arturians say that there's a trifecta between uh, um, religion, um, extraterrestrials, and Native American medicine. So there's a, a trifecta there um, that is very important to maintain those connections. But to get into the answer to your question, uh, once again, I, like I mentioned before, I've done thousands of Akashic readings uh, for people of many different star lineages, uh, a lot of star seeds, even some, you know, folks from that are connected to alternate realms. But mm -hmm. what I see a lot with shamanism, this was something that was also a personal interest of mine, uh, is that a lot of the concepts of shamanism actually originated from the Pleiades. So a lot of people, um, I think it's becoming more and more of common knowledge that, you know, hey, there's these indigenous people, they got their information from someplace, okay? They didn't just come up with it. I mean, they they brought it from other star systems. Uh, the Lakota in particular claimed to have direct ancestry from the Pleiades, uh, which is in the Taurus constellation. Um, so, and, and and this is also including other other tribes, you know, throughout North America and South America and other locations throughout the uh, the planet. Um, I don't know if um, the, since this is going to be probably talked about at the Mexico City conference, uh, I think it'll be interesting to note that a lot of the Mayans actually uh, have their temples aligned with the Pleiades. Why is that? Okay, why why would they pick the Pleiades out of all these other star systems? It's because that's where they originated from and they were honoring that through their temples. Uh, they also had temples aligned with the, the Venus planet, um, which is also um, within our solar system, but they also had a connection with Venus. Um, and we can get into that a little bit later, but I wanna focus more on the Pleiades at the moment. But, um, my understanding when I looked at the different cultures within the Pleiades, the Pleiades is actually an asterism. It's not like one star. It actually has at least 14 stars, seven of which were probably most likely inhabited. Uh, and they, each of these stars had their own planets, their own culture, their own civilizations uh, under the umbrella of the entire Pleiades civilization. So one star system I'm going to really focus on for this question is, is Maya. Um, Maya was, I'm getting chills talking about this, probably because I feel this love for Maya. But um, Maya is this amazing little star system. It's not as well known as Alcyon or Taigeta, but it's this amazing star system that always had its focus on on uh, nature spirituality. So the compilation of the natural world and spirituality, and this was always their focus. Um, so the Maya civilization was the one civilization in the Pleiades that came up with the concept of shamanism, which is actually integrating the concepts of our natural reality with spirituality and allowing that natural reality to aid in our spiritual growth. Um, so this is uh, something that they were focused on. Um, the other thing that came up with the Maya civilization is they were really um, in the Maya, uh, Maya, Maya star system, not, not to be confused with the Mayans in Mexico. But um, another thing about the civilization is that they were very interested in spiritual archeology. span um, which at first, when I saw that, I was like, what the heck is spiritual archaeology? But apparently they were integrating spiritual concepts from across the galaxy within their star system. So they were actually recording and um, going, actually they were visiting other star systems. So these people also had enough technology to do this. Um, so they would visit other planets and other realities 
to um, achieve uh, an opportunity to, to do archaeological research into different spiritual concepts, kind of like what the Syrians were doing with the Syrian mystery schools. But, but they were doing this out of Maya, and they were bringing this information back and recording it, you know, so they were, um, and they were integrating all these concepts with, with the, with the shamanistic practices that they were, they were doing in the Maya system. Um, now, not all Pleiadians, um, this is kind of a fallacy, but not all Pleiadians are tall, blonde looking Nordic people. Okay. I, I, I kind of, kind of get tired of that that stereotype. I mean, I know there's quite a few Pleiadians that probably look like that, but actually the Pleiadians that were in the Maya and Merope systems actually had darker hair and darker skin. Um, and this was a development of their genetics from living in, you know, the natural environment where they're, you know, they, it was those planetary influences on, you know, the development of what they looked like. Uh, so it's very well possible, and I believe this personally, that the indigenous people that currently live here on earth or, or have been living here on earth for thousands of years have a direct um, ancestral connection to these beings that came from these systems. Uh, so this is why they've been practicing shamanism for thousands and thousands of years because they carried this information with them when they decided to colonize planet Earth. Uh, so I, I do believe, and this is a little bit of conspiracy theory um, here, but I do believe that maybe some of the reasons why, you know, the European civilization was trying to wipe out the indigenous people, you know, back in the day was because uh, they were trying to wipe out this information from being um, being uh, cultivated throughout our planet. So they were trying to suppress the divine feminine. So uh, this is just my personal belief, but um, um, among, so it wasn't just a land grab, although that, that did have a lot to do with it. But, uh, but getting back on track here with the shamanistic practices, one of the, um, the biggest practices to come out of the Maya civilization in particular was light activation shamanism, okay? Um, this is the capacity of, of all humans to learn to utilize light activation to create their own Merkabas, which is gonna enable them to travel interdimensionally to other star systems and other realities. And this is something that the Mayas has known about for quite a long time. Um, I actually believe that the Maya people ascended. They didn't just disappear. They probably ascended into a different dimension at some point, but because they were trying to carry this knowledge with them because they did not feel that humanity was quite ready for this level of technology. This is a, a very interdimensional high frequency technology. Um, and they didn't want it going into the wrong hands. So, um, so this is going to be some, um, some the future of shamanism, where we're going to be moving beyond just okay, I'm going on a vision quest. I'm going to connect with my animal totems and and have you know deep meditation, you know, over a three day period, to really going into the depths of what the Maya civilization and the Pleiades was trying to teach us back in the day, you know, so they, what they were bringing to, to planet earth. And this is part, I, I think this kind of answers a little bit of your previous question too, like, where are we going? Okay, so what was our intention all along? Well, if you have 12 strand DNA, and if you're ascended, okay, so if you're connected to the fifth dimension, it becomes uh, really, really easy to create a Merkaba. And, uh, and really, really easy to astro travel to multiple different star systems by just teleportation and not by you know physical means. Uh, so um, a little bit more about the Maya civilization um, in the Pleiades. Uh, I do get a number of star seeds that have a connection with Maya and also Merope. Um, and uh, 
these people um, were very inwardly focused. They did have enough technology to be able to do their archaeological projects, but um, but these people were mostly highly, highly spiritual. They were a highly divine feminine star system. Um, so very much, uh, very well balanced in the divine feminine principles, uh, which makes them a little different from other the uh, some of the other star systems in in the Pleiades, such as uh, my uh, Merope, or uh, actually they were pretty similar to Merope. I'm sorry, but. Uh, to Tigeta or Alcyon that were more masculine oriented systems. But, um, um, but these folks were um, pretty much, they looked like indigenous people from planet earth. Um, and like I said, a lot of these native American and other indigenous tribes claim ancestry to the Pleiades because they know where they came from. So that's pretty much what I have for that. <laughs> And I also understand that's very true for Lemuria, that mm -hmm. they insist that the beings that came here and helped them start the population and the land and their practices, same were the Pleiadians. Uh, Cryon talks about this, Lee Carroll. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very well aware of the Lemurian connection to the Pleiades, uh, or I'm sorry, the Lemurian connection to the Pleiades and also to Andromeda and Arcturus. So they're... So they had um, influences from other star systems, but I would say in terms of shamanism, uh, definitely a connection to the Pleiades. Uh, the uh, my understanding with the Aborigine people in, from Australia, and this is something I also saw in the records, was that they're direct descendants from Lemurians. So, um, so their their concepts still live on, but. Uh, but very, very underground at this point. Um, it won't always be this way, though. I think we're moving out of that underground phase into um, an embrace, embracing all of these beautiful uh, cultural influences from all these different star systems. Beautiful. Tell me about that. Do you foresee or have you seen in the records at any point that the shamans who have been held down and persecuted for so very long are actually the ones who are going to be the way showers and also the connectors because if they've already been connecting throughout their history and if their inception is not even from here mm -hmm. that they will be showing us humanity the way they'll be the connectors um to create so much safety and understand the language and understand the practice and, and what's next for us. Will they be involved in that at all? Oh, totally. Uh, I think it's currently happening. I, I do see um, quite a few amazing shamans and shamanistic teachers uh, all throughout the planet that are stepping up, that are taking us by the hand and and showing us the way to um, a pathway between this reality and our ascension to the fifth dimension. Um, uh, my understanding is that um, right now uh, we're kind of, we're going through this great phase of clearing, clearing old ancestral karma, clearing um, old uh, and uh, old old patterns that are no longer serving us at this time. So uh, for the last few years, um, I've had a lot of clients very interested in Akashic clearings, which is a practice I also do, uh, which I'm gonna be teaching a course about maybe in the next year. But um, in order to clear all this heavy karma that we picked up from our past lives here on earth and enabling us to release all of that um, heavy energy so that we can upgrade our DNA so that we can prepare for this ascension process. Some of the uh, shamanistic practices that I mentioned, such as the light activation shamanism, um, is going to enable us to do this much more rapidly. Okay, so we're not going to, I mean, I think the technologies, the med beds are going to help with this, but um, I see us moving even beyond having to use medical devices to um, do this energetically on our own. 
And the shamans are going to be the ones to show us how to do that. And uh, from there, we will start uh, really aligning our our seven chakras and also our five out of body chakras. So those are going to get totally aligned and activated. And this is going to enable us to create our own personal portals into the connection with these different star systems. Uh, at the same time, my understanding is probably in 2028, between 2028 and 2032. So this is coming up very rapidly. <laughs> so um, my understanding from what I see and saw in the records is that we're going to have our first extraterrestrial contact where everybody knows about it, where it's not going to be hidden. OK, this is going to happen um, between this period of time. And around this time, things are going to dramatically change at this point. There is going to be no secrets. There is going to be no suppression of extraterrestrial gene uh, genetics and extraterrestrial uh, the technologies at this point. Uh, and my understanding from the beings that are going to be contacting us first is not going to be the Pleiadians. Um, a lot of people say that, but... I actually think the beings that are going to be connecting with us first will be the Alpha Centaurians and the Tau Cetians, because they're the two um, extraterrestrial races of human, humanoid type of beings that are actually located closest to planet Earth. Uh, uh, Tau Ceti is located very close, is in the constellation of Cetus, the whale. Um, Alpha Centauri is in the Centaurus system. Alpha Centauri is actually our closest extraterrestrial neighbor. They're only 3.7 light years from planet Earth. Uh, so it makes sense that, and they're the most human looking, I would say, or they, they are probably the most like us as far as their appearance. So I think they, they will be the first ones to reach out to us and uh, kind of acclimate us to normalizing contact with extraterrestrial beings. Um, and the Alpha Centaurians have a very interesting history. Um, I'll get a little bit into their history. I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but they actually um, initially resided in Venus, which is interesting. Um, and then Venus uh, somehow had uh, a, a major physical catastrophe, which forced the Venusians to leave the, uh, physically that planet and actually migrate to the Alpha Centauri system. Um, so a lot of times when I do readings for people that have a connection with Alpha Centauri, I also, I often see also a correlation with the Venus planet. Um, and that could also have maybe have a correlation with the Mayans in Mexico. You know, why are they so connected with Venus? You know, so... Um, so there's correlations there. The Venusians also had an influence on, um, and they've also uh, had physical contact with planet Earth back in the 1950s. I don't think that was very successful, but they did try to reach out to us. But um, currently the, Ven the Venusian race is living in an alternate dimension. So, um, so they're no longer physically living on the Venus planet because it's in uninhabitable at this point. But uh, at one time it was inhabitable. Um, but a lot of the Venusian race ended up in the Alpha Centauri system. Tau Ceti is a little interesting system. It's not very well known in the spiritual community, but the Tau Cetians were um, kind of shorter, stockier looking people. Um, uh, and they do have genetic influences on Earth, but particularly among the uh, Slavic and Russian um, areas of planet Earth. But um, these folks were, uh, or these beings, um, were known to be excellent pilots and navigators. Uh, they they had to develop these technical skills because they were constantly having uh, conflicts with gray aliens. So um, they became very skilled in uh, certain certain um, technical aspects. Um, so they're, they're well known. There's also a bear-like race of beings that live in um, Tau Ceti. Okay, a lot of people don't know about this too, but um, I actually saw these bear-like beings when I did like a little remote viewing session one time. I was curious about Tau Ceti, wanted to learn more about it. And I found myself um, remote viewing 
um, a group of Tau Cetian pilots along with their bear compatriots and they look kind of like Wookiees. I don't know. It was kind of amazing. But so they're, the Wookiees actually come from someplace. They're not just a, 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 a fallacy from Star Wars. But um, but these beings were very intelligent and they picked up on my presence right away and they asked me who I was. And of course, I told them and they were OK with me hanging out since they knew I'm a fellow star person and I'm just there um, to satisfy my curiosity. But um, I had this amazing encounter with Talcetti and uh, I love their culture. They have a great sense of humor. They like to joke about draconians quite a bit so from the little bit I had contact with. But, um, but anyway, that's what I have for that. But wow, I mean, I could just go on and on. It's so much. But, uh, but thank you for the opportunity. How can humanity best prepare for benevolent ET contact? You're talking about the races, uh, and I've heard this before, so I know you are verifying. I know it is truth. I feel it. It is so exciting, this open contact that mm -hmm. we can no longer, the government can no longer push down the truth, right? Exactly. People, yeah. even through fear or ignorance, just not knowing, can look out and say, well, I've never seen it. I don't understand the proof this is made up. That there is a time coming up very soon where it is going to be fact. Mm -hmm. We are not the only ones here. There are others. <laughs> and we are going to have open contact. And so first of all, I understand it's benevolent. Will you verify mm -hmm. that? And second of all, what can we do? What can humanity, people on this earth do? So we are prepared for the best experience, for something that's open, positive, and something that's sharing of information back and forth. I would say uh, this is something that my guides always tell me when, as far as extraterrestrial contact, but really working on keeping our vibrations high. Um, these beings are because they're higher vibrational, they don't want to feel like they have to come all the way down to third dimension to connect with us. Uh, they would prefer for us to meet them halfway. Um, and uh, so anything that we can do currently to keep our vibrations at its highest point, uh, and that could be a multitude of different ways how we do that. Uh, you know, one of the easiest ways through meditation, daily meditation. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I had my issues with meditation, but my guides taught me how important it was. So now I do it every day. But uh, um, so daily meditation, uh, uh, really focusing on as high a vibrational diet as possible. So I'm not saying that everybody needs to be vegan or eat only raw, raw plants, but anything that we can do to keep our vibration high, even physically, maybe eating purple or, or purple uh, fruits or blue fruits, because um, this helps open up the third eye. Doing the third eye um, work also helps a lot because this enables us to see beyond the 3D matrix. Um, so um, I've taught a few courses on how to open the third eye and how to work with third eye energy, but, um, but that too is gonna help us connect with these beings a lot better. Um, and then also I would say um, keeping an open mind, you know, they're not gonna be like us, you know, I mean, there are gonna be aspects of them that will be like us, but there's gonna be aspects of their culture and how they look that is gonna be very different. And so there's a level of perhaps inclusivity that um, uh, is, is gonna to need to be prominent in the earth culture in order to accept these beings, you know, because they're going to be look they're going to be looking and and speaking and presenting themselves differently than what we're used to here on earth uh so so i would say it's a combination of factors but i would say most importantly keeping the vibration high and the other thing they like to see too is us being of service to others um they love to see that they they love to connect with those that are selflessly helping others on the planet I'm going to ask you, I know that Lyra was destroyed in the Draconian Wars. 
are there still Lirans? And that's the first question. And yes, are there still Lirans? Do they still exist? And if so, where? Um, yes, the Lirans still exist. Um, they, they exist in alternate realities. And I understand that quite a few Lirans after that escaped the wars um, probably are residing um, underground here on Earth. Uh, so a lot of the um, the underground or the inner Earth people are likely um, Lyran, Lyran uh, descendants. Um, so they physically exist, but they also exist in alternate dimensions and alternate timelines. My understanding with planet Earth is that currently, um, and this is hard to believe, but at one time, the Earth axis, uh, axis was aligned with Draco. It was aligned with Thuban. Okay, it used to be aligned with uh, Vega millions of years ago, which is in the Lyra system. Then it got shifted to Thuban, which shows the influence of the Draconians in our galaxy. Then it got shifted around the, um, I would say maybe the, around the time of Christ, perhaps, um, to uh, Polaris, which is currently located right now. So Earth is aligned, Earth's North Star is Polaris. Uh, however, my understanding is in a few thousand years from now, it's gonna shift again to Vega, okay? Um, and what that is foretelling of is of us actually getting realigned with our original human template. So the original human template, we're getting back to that 12 strand DNA, is, is to be higher humans, is to have a multitude of psychic and uh, interdimensional abilities that has been turned off for earth humans for quite a while. And we're moving back to that original template, but to answer your question, yes, the Lyrans do still exist. They serve, there's quite a few Lyran uh, extraterrestrials that serve in the Galactic Federation, from what I understand. The Elohim, which is the co-creators of the Lyran races, still exist. Um, I know you have a personal connection with that. Um, so, um, and so a lot of us that are star seeds right now, we're here to carry out the work. We're the kind of like the ground troops on this planet. And they're um, in, the, in the wings, kind of helping us and guiding us. Uh, through uh, their energetic connections with us. How would one know if they were interacting with a Lyran? Would they ever come to the surface for any reason to connect with us or with somebody or with a governance body? Um, that's a good question. I would say if a Lyran was to uh, visit planet Earth, it would probably have to happen after that initial contact I told you about with the 20... 32 timeline. Um, that's a rough estimate. I'm not saying, you know, it's absolutely going to happen that year, but uh, I keep seeing between 2028 and 2032, but it could be as far back as 2035. I, I know who knows, but um, it depends a lot on how quickly we, we ascend here on this planet, but which I think is going to be dramatic in the next few years. But uh, as far as Lyran's connecting with planet earth, I do think that will happen um, once the Galactic Federation has a direct involvement with, with our governments. Uh, my understanding is our governmental structure throughout the entire planet is going to change dramatically in the next, it's actually happening as we speak. Uh, the, um, the current government is actually crumbling and uh, the media has kept this facade of, oh yeah, everything's fine, everything's normal, but it's not, it's crumbling. And uh, there's going to be new governmental systems in place that are going to be more aligned with uh, the galactic councils, um, which uh, eventually uh, Earth, it, Earth's ultimate destiny is also to become part of the greater galactic family and part of the uh, galactic federation, which will be an amazing time when that happens. Yes. Amen. That sounds so exciting to me. So yeah. Beyond hopeful, I think it's why we're all here. It is why we're all here. It's time. It's time for this planet to join its uh, galactic family again.
And I'm going to end with this. If we can talk about time travel and alien time travel, I believe that most of us are aware that the advanced technology that they use allows them to port into another dimension, another time, future past, different realms. Can you talk about what knowledge you have of time travel and anything you think that might positively impact us? Um, yes, I've actually done a couple of readings for, this is really interesting. I, have, I, I don't see this very often, but I, I've done a couple of Kashic readings for individuals whose souls actually originated from the future. They actually decided to incarnate in the past in order to shift the timelines. Uh, one of them was from, I think, the Essasani race, and the other one was from uh, Yael. Um, and I think the Yael uh, uh, Akashic reading is actually on my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in that, you can go listen to that to that video that's on my YouTube channel. But um, but the way they do it is not so much with a time travel machine. They do it through through uh, more through thrifting, uh, shifting through uh, uh, the time space continuum. So they they learn how to to transport themselves energetically through uh, through time and space um, rather than using a physical machine. Um, and a lot of these uh, benevolent star races and even not so benevolent star races have this technology. They know how to do this. Uh, they've been doing it for thousands of years. Um, as a matter of fact, when we're in the higher dimensional realms, there is no linear time. So if you're able to ascend to say the fifth dimension or the sixth dimension or the seventh dimension, it becomes very, very easy to time travel because there is, there's not that barrier that we see right now in this 3D matrix that we're currently residing in. Um, in the 3D matrix, time continues to be very linear, um, but that's not the true nature of time. Time is supposed to be uh, simultaneously occurring at the same time. Uh, so a lot of these beings have learned, you know, through their understanding of physics, how to transcend through these different timelines. A lot of times, my, my understanding is some, some of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of Mandela effects right now, especially in the last few years. Um, and what a Mandela effect is, is I, I don't know if, if your audience totally understands what this means, but is when we, like I say, a logo has a, a, a slight change or there's a, somebody says something in a movie and it, and then, you know, we understand it to be a certain phrase, but then when we replay the movie, they're saying something completely different, okay? Um, so this is called a Mandela effect. Um, and so a lot of people think, okay, I understand this existed. Like, why, why is it not showing up anymore? Why is it showing up differently? It's because the timelines are shifting and changing, okay? Um, and timelines get collapsed, they, they, uh, they shift, they change. Um, so this, um, I guess this very apocalyptic view of Earth's future has actually been shifted from what I understand to a much more positive outcome for planet Earth where we are gonna have that extraterrestrial interaction. We are gonna be shifting um, into other dimensions. Uh, we're no longer gonna be stuck in the 3D matrix. Uh, there's not gonna be this catastrophe that's gonna completely wipe out all living life on planet earth, which is what was being foretold for thousands of years. Uh, this has been shifted. And because of this, we're, stout, we're seeing, you know, just as regular humans, you know, well, gosh, you know, I, I keep seeing these weird Mandela effects. Um, uh, and, uh, one of the ones that I personally noticed was I remember in the 1980s watching a movie called Sinbad. And I remember watching that stupid movie and I was just like, oh, you know what? I remember that movie. How come I can't find it anymore? You know, and uh, 
Um, and it doesn't exist. And as a matter of fact, the person that acted in that movie um, says he's never acted in a movie called Sinbad, which is like, a, but I was actually able to find a movie poster of Sinbad online. And I'm like, okay, I know this movie existed because I remember watching it, but now everybody is saying that it never existed. So that's a, a good example of a Mandela effect. And you see it with um, with uh, movie phrases in Star Wars and some of the logos, you know, that are being used by corporations. Some of those have shifted and changed. And so this is kind of like a physical manifestation of these timeline changes. Uh, but getting, getting back to the, the, the interdimensional travel and the time travel that you were asking about originally, uh, these extraterrestrials have the capacity to shift time. Um, and a lot of the benevolent races are currently trying to do this in order to align us to a higher timeline. To, to avoid that apocalyptic ending or that that uh, horrific ending that uh, people such as Nostradamus has predicted, you know, in, back in the past. Uh, and um, because of this, you know, we do see the physical manifestations of it. Um, um, the other thing that we're also going to see is that the dimensions are going to become much more distinct, where those of us that are on the ascension path are going to be finding that our realities are going to look completely different from those that are still st stuck in the 3D. Um, and we might even lose connections with certain people. We might lose family members. There might be an attrition of souls from this planet because um, they're unwilling or have chosen not to be part of this ascension process. Um, and this is where timelines also play a part into this, this realm. Um, it's gonna be exciting times. It's gonna be very, very uh, different than, than I think what's been predicted, but I think it's gonna be um, a beautiful uh, adventure into the golden new age of the fifth dimension. So I'm, I'm all for it.